This is the workshop number two, uh, focusing on energy and environment. Um, I'm Nobuo Tanaka, uh, the ex executive director of the... We have six panelists. Um, you know uh, them, I don't explain uh, to you, Olivia Pell and Ali Zero Ali, uh, Leila Benali, uh, Richard Cooper, Cosmin Gida, and Tatsuro Masuda. So we will talk about uh, climate issues uh, but uh, this morning, we had very interesting uh, plenary. The Roran Fabius and uh, Patrick Puyane made a very interesting introduction for us about the role of uh, government, state, uh, and how the ambition must come from the leadership. And the issue of the future of the coal is very interesting one. Uh, certainly renewable energy, nuclear, how can we use advanced innovation technologies? Uh, that's certainly the issue. I will use my slide and before starting, each of us will make some seven, eight minutes uh, the initial remark and then open for the uh, discussion. But uh, could you make a slide of mine, at place? Yes, this is uh, uh, my contribution to the group. Innovation for Cool Earth. This is a forum created by former, I mean, current Prime Minister uh, Abe five, uh, five years ago. Uh, it is uh, consisting of the uh, energy related people at the steering committee and it is exchanging uh, views and information and making international links of experts or for techno uh, technological innovation for the sustainability. Um, this year, we had uh, just a meeting uh, about a week ago, and uh, about 1,000 people st participated from 70 countries, and I'm the chairing of this steering committee. So I just want to say s that the short word, what had happened there, and what was the message. Um, this is a picture of uh, this ISEF group and uh, another two groups which concurrent back-to-back uh, uh, -back, uh, 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 held in, in Tokyo. One is the TCFD summit. TCFD is Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosure, started at G20 by the Mark Carney, the central banker of the UK, and Michael Bloomberg started uh, for the G20 countries about disclosing the risk, financial risk of the corporations for the investors. So Japanese uh, government promoted that substantially in the last about a year and uh, there are 199 Japanese corporations signed up. So this financial sector's pressure is getting very strong. So this ISEF is that uh, very back uh, together with uh, this TCFD group, uh, we made a, uh, let's say, a contribution and we made a me meeting with Prime Minister in the uh, Prime Minister's office and uh, remind him of how we should move. And he urged us, by the way, uh, calling for much more uh, serious uh, uh, effort, he said, it should be the unconventional and this continuous innovation is necessary. And uh, in the sessions, there are many different, I mean, uh, uh, let's say, uh, issues are treated, but the subject of this uh, ISEF was bending down the emission trajectory by innovation and green finance. Because uh, the geo uh, CO2, global CO2 emissions are uh, increasing at about 2% per year, and uh, which is in line with the long-term historical trends uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That means the gap of uh, this trend and the uh, global goal of uh, net zero emission by 2050 is widening every year. So enormous effort is necessary. So ISEF uh, 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 do a lot of things, but uh, how to bend down the emission trajectory with all possible measures, including financial or 
new technology, etc., is is the critical issue. Um, I I have did a lot about uh, uh, the, the, the roadmaps, and this year's roadmap was decarbonization in the industrial heat sector. Industrial heat is a very uh, tough area, so using more CCUS <coughs> or uh, hydrogen biomass. Um, electrification and all possible tools are used to reduce uh, uh, energy uh, CO2 emission from steel making or cement, etc. Uh, of course, uh, top 10 innovation, uh, there are many different um, kinds of uh, uh, technologies on the commercial scale from, or from the research and development stage. Uh, we pick up several of these innovative technologies and and uh, participants voted who which are most likely technology so, so these top ten votes of participants another message which is this is this is interesting this is the infographics of the uh, excuse me uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is a top ten innovation. I'm sorry, and this is the infographics um, uh, for from the uh, this uh, meeting, and and of course, from now we need immediate peak and vigorous decline. So Bob Slay was uh, uh, taken up, showing how quick we have to do, and another point which I really. Uh, raised is the role of women in the climate change mitigation. Um, climate change is not gender neutral. Uh, women are much more uh, harshly hit by the climate change, especially in African countries, because farmers are more always more uh, women and and fetching the water with climate change, uh, much more effort are uh, required. On the other hand, women can do a lot to change the policy by voting, by becoming uh, business leaders and changing the business model. So women's role for climate change mitigation could be much more stressed. So gender <laughs> issue and uh, climate issue should come together. That, so, uh, so for the financial sector, TCFD is a green financing, means climate lens investment. So gender lens investment should come together. That is one of the uh, point which this group has discussed and uh, recommended. Um, I, I don't want to go too far, but uh, IEA always say uh, revolution has happening in many fronts, and one in U.S., two in the solar power is the cheapest in the future. The third is uh, the China's green revolution, and fourth is digitalization. But the important fifth revolution, which I want to add, is this demand-side-driven transformation. Uh, because uh, TCFD, uh, through TCFD, the money goes to more sustainable companies. And they are, in a way, user of the energy. So if <coughs> these companies try to be more and more sustainable, you know, this may cause the structure of the supply. Uh, IEA or government always thinking from the supply side, <laughs> but demand side driven transformation may change drastically the structure. And another example is RE100, Renewable Energy 100 corporations. These are the list of corporations, um, but uh, major uh, corporations like Apple, GM, BMW, if they require their suppliers to do the same, and it is the case, uh, maybe those companies who stay in the supply chain of the major global corporations will use only renewables in the future. And this may create a huge challenge for the struct supply structure of the energy. So energy uh, transformation could be driven much more by the users rather than supplier. 
what the government. So this is one of my uh, points which I want to raise to Roland Fabius' point about the role of the state. State should kind of prepare the incentives or financial schemes or standards for the disclosures and let corporations or users decide the future. This is one of the message I want to uh, share with you. Another one is that uh, uh, IEA's uh, energy uh, demand uh, prospect shows that uh, it's not easy to see the peak demand of oil happens. But uh, if demand side uh, change uh, happens quickly, maybe peak demand happens much earlier. So that is what Saudi Aramco is concerned. Um, I told you about this last year, I guess, but uh, uh, peak demand of oil may happen much, much earlier. I talked with uh, recently the Chinese experts, and they say peak demand of oil in China may happen before 2025. It's five years from now. Um, and peak demand of a uh, peak emission of the CO2 may happen even 2022. That is what Chinese say. So their strategy is uh, using more renewables and reducing oil and gas import from Middle East, from Russia, and from United States. It's, this is geopolitical strategy of China, but at the same time, it's sustainable. Uh, energy uh, policy. So this is very interesting. To help uh, those uh, producer and uh, uh, or gas oil exporters, one way is using more hydrogen. This is a very common subject of ISEF and uh, G20 that uh, uh, to make green oil, green gas, only uh, hydrogen with CCUS uh, may be exported or used. So hydrogen could be still costly option, but uh, Japan has been promoting use of hydrogen, but China is taken up very seriously these days because of the extra uh, generation of solar and uh, wind could be stored as hydrogen. So as a storage, hydrogen may be used much more, uh, let's say, uh, substantially in the future. So I stop here in my uh, presentation about the, this uh, kind of contributions from the ISEF to you. And uh, let's uh, start. Uh, the, each other, uh, the individual uh, panelists to present their case. I will take up Olivia Appel first, and then uh, Leila will follow, okay? Okay. Okay. There's an echo still. So... Presentation, the troisième. No. Uh, by the way, this session must end at uh, 19 o'clock. So. Okay. Okay, so I will move uh, very rapidly. I was asked to discuss about uh, biogas which is uh, one part of the solution of the climate change issue. Uh, most of the attention today is uh, focused on the solar and wind, thanks to their sp spectacular expansion and cost reduction. But uh, step back and consider the whole energy system, and you will find another picture. Modern bioenergy is playing the dominant role. Uh, why? Simply, uh, electricity, it's simple. Electricity only accounts for less than 20% of total energy consumption worldwide, and bi bioenergy is the only renewable source that can provide energy for all end use. And the contribution of modern bioenergy is particularly important in heat, 
two thirds of uh, that heat goes to industrial uh, application and the rest is consumed in buildings with a very small remaining fracture in agriculture. As a result, uh, at the end of uh, uh, 2017, modern bioenergy encountered for the half of renewable energy consumption. As much as hydropower, wind, solar, and all other renewables combine, and four times the amount of wind and solar combined. I wish to underline that all these numbers concern just modern energy and uh, ex are excluding traditional use of bi biomass, for example, <coughs> by, for cooking in developing countries, which is causing air pollution, indoor air pollution, and premature death. The dominant role of modern bioenergy is often overlooked. This is why we consider it a blind spot, the overlooked giant of renewable. This is not to undermine the role of electricity, of course, just bioenergy as many more competi competing options. So, uh, in order to reach the sustainable development scenario, the IA is considering that renewable would contribute to one third of greenhouse gas emission reductions. You are accustomed to this figure, and you can see that bioenergy contribution is representing 7.5 percent of uh, the gap by 2040. And uh, also, you can note that uh, bioenergy can be combined with CCUS in order to provide negative emission, and I hope that we will come back during the debate on the issue of CCS and CCUS. Biomethane, I will focus now on biomethane. Biomethane will play a major role. In just seven years, biomethane production has increased by a factor of seven. Most of the growth ha has occurred in Europe, but every region is participating in the global growth. In 2017, 720 biomethane production plants are in operation in the world, compared to only 173 in 2010. And spread over 34 countries, there are 1,020 projects of upgrading operational plants under construction or planned. Europe is representing, as I said, an important part, uh, and uh, uh, European production is booming. Europe represents two-thirds of the present production. Germany and UK are the leaders, but this sector is booming everywhere. And according to the report, uh, gas, uh, uh, gas for Climate, the production may reach 95 BCM in 2050, of which 62 from anaerobic digestion. Outside uh, Europe, uh, biomethane is developing very rapidly in the United States, driven by support to advanced fuel. It is a way to reduce methane emission from waste. This development is strongly supported by regulation, regu uh, renewable fuel standard, volume obligation, and certificate markets. And 82 projects are for timing under construction or planned. And uh, you, can, uh, you have to notice that the US is the, lord, the world leader for bio natural gas vehicle and bio LNG. China will uh, become the giant as well in the biomethane market. It is in China, this market is just emerging with only 40 units at the end of 2017, but China launched in 2015 
200 large-scale project. And this policy aims at first ensuring uh, security of gas supply, fighting against local production, pollution, and also developing rural areas. A three-phase policy of industrialization has been decided with an objective to produce 30 BCM by 2030 based on financial incentives and green gas quotas. So let's move to the conclusion. <coughs> Just in a summary, uh, there are promising developments all around the world. In Europe, the use of biomethane is spreading across the continent, all across the continent, with a huge potential of 95 BCM in 2050. Uh, in North America, there is a surging production over the recent period, propelled by the, uh, the US to the first rank of the world for the use of biomethane in uh, uh, vehicles with a significant potential of 30 to 40 BCM, mostly from waste. In Asia, uh, I, we have to note the recent adoption of the biogas updating, uh, uh, upgrading technology by China and India, this is a, a game changer. I refer to the objective of 30 BCM for China in 2030. It's, no, it's less uh, clear for India. And uh, there are also projects elsewhere. And just a summary at the bottom of this, of this page, developments of uh, uh, biomethane uh, is linked in every country to subsidies to cost reduction linked to industrialization and also to sustainable resources. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Olivier. Why, why did you pick up uh, biomethane this time? Uh, because it is ignored as such? Uh, <coughs> it is uh, becoming very popular, for example, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, in the context of, in the context of uh, zero of uh, uh, carbon neutrality in 2050, there is no more place in Europe for, uh, there is no more place in Europe for the, for natural gas, uh, for, uh, for, um, and so the solution is to develop, uh, is to base the solution of now on uh, bio, on different uh, alternative of uh, fossilism.
First question is: uh, If you assume that, if you agree that consumers are leading the change, they have a role in leading this transition by their consum by the by the choices that they're making, um, and that technologies and governments are enabling the transition, somebody has to absorb the risks, and this is where the investors come come into play. Uh, second question is: If we agree that changes are already happening, and I insist on the fact that the changes have to happen at scale, and I will insist on that for the rest of this, for this workshop. Uh, and if we agree that multiple solutions are required, and, and Olivier has just given us one <laughs> of the multiple solutions that has to be uh, a part of the energy mix, for them, from an institutional investor investor's perspective, where should we invest? Uh, and I'll finish uh, briefly my presentation with what is left for governments to do in this uh, in, in, in this area. And I think uh, Mr. Uh, Monsieur Laurent Fabius and uh, Patrick Pouyanné have already hinted to this, the fact that we all agree that carbon pricing has to uh, has to uh, be agreed on, whether we like it or not. But I think there's an agreement uh, in that regard. And then I'll finish with what is left for companies to do. Um, uh, we were, I don't know, we, no, the energy industry has been uh, pushed to do more with less, to, uh, to go for more uh, vertical integration and capital efficiency. And this is where, here again, institutional investors are coming into play in, in that marriage between finance and energy. Um, so I'll s I'm, let me start with the first one. Uh, when it comes to uh, risks, I think the momentum, I think we can all agree today that the momentum to reinforce uh, the national contributions is possibly the highest ever that we've ever seen. However, and I think it has been highlighted again uh, this morning, it is not sufficient. And there are a few issues that I would like to highlight here again from the perspective of, of, of an institutional investor or the from the perspective of the, of the energy sector. The first issue is that uh, global climate governance is very, very deeply questioned. And I will not delve into the details of why it is being questioned. We are living in an era of where we are questioning multilateralism, we are questioning free trade, we are questioning uh, security, uh, uh, we are even questioning, I mean, we also have, a, uh, I would say, crisis of leadership, but I guess that's a, that's a discussion for another session than this one. Uh, but the point is, is that even in October 2018, when the IPCC report uh, uh, was issued, and even if it was alarming enough, it was not. It did not accelerate the required changes that we uh, that, that that are required. So there is, I think, and that's probably the change this year. There is a growing realization uh, across the board of the complexity of the task. There is a growing realization of the wide interests and needs of the different stakeholders involved. I mean, going from, uh, I would say, consumers, taxpayers, citizens, uh, vulnerable populations, and of course the industrials, the, 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 the energy producers and consumers, etc. So from where I sit, I, I think there is a, a growing realization that uh, 
the existing energy system that we have today, which, and I would like to remind you, we took probably a large part of the 20th century to build, has seen costs that cannot just simply be written off. The energy system we have today has seen costs in it that we cannot write off as, and from the investor's perspective, that's a key part. However, and I don't wanna, <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong, changes are already happening and uh, leading energy companies, leading companies, uh, cities, mayors, uh, populations, economic sectors, I work a lot with the maritime, you know, with the maritime industries, they have been taking concrete actions to either decrease their emissions or fully decarbonize. Uh, shareholders, insurance companies, institutional investors, as you all know, have been raising the pressure to align the corporate strategies with the climate reality. I mean, we, we are, we are, that's something that we have to, to deal with. So one of my favorite graphics from the, the BP's energy outlook shows how, how long it, it, it takes for energy transitions to occur. And uh, our common friend Spencer Dale likes to remind us with his uh, dotted line that uh, you probably don't see here, but it's, uh, it's the, 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 the big line that you have on the graphic. I don't know why it is show as plain, but it's the, 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 the one at the, at the extreme uh, high. With that dotted line, it shows that renewable energy may reach 10% of, of the world energy demand by 2035 in less than 30 years from the point it provided 1% of world energy. And in, if that's the case, if we just extrapolate that trend, uh, it, would, it means that renewable energy would have penetrated the, the energy system more quickly than any other fuel in history. And even then, even that ten, with that 10%, if you reach that 10% of renewable energy, you still need 90, you have still 90% to cover. 90% uh, of the world energy needs will need to come from other fuels. My personal take from this graphic is slightly different. Um, particularly if I isolate the two fastest growing technologies, renewable energy indeed, and nuclear. Uh, and I, the conclusion that I take from it, and that's a very quick conclusion that I'm sure Kasmin uh, will, will, will probably challenge, is that uh, impactful change really generally occur, I mean, in, in these two specific examples, first, when the debate has been depoliticized, aka nuclear, and when there is a combination of intensive R&D, government incentives, but also, of course, enabling market mechanisms, and I'm insisting on this one, and free trade. Only free trade enabled solar panels to move from one continent to the other, and re we reached the decreasing cost that we have witnessed in the last decade. The same dynamic is happening uh, at a slower pace, I must say, in other areas. And it is happening, and I think in this order, number one, in uh, energy batteries and storage, and we've discussed it last year, I think, extensively. It's also happening at a second, second in mobility, in the area of mobility, and also it's happening uh, third in uh, process and heavy industries that Tanaka-san has hint started hitting at in his presentation. But f here again, from an investor perspective, this lack of visibility on the sequencing is probably the first missing link that we have in our uh, climate change governance toolbox. So w w I think we need targeted instruments with uh, uh, optimal risk returns ratios for the various emitting sectors with various utilizations to really accelerate this transition. So the governments can guide the energy mix, the ensuing investments through their uh, toolkit of various policy mechanisms, but I think only institutional investors can help absorb the market risks, but also the technology risks that I'm, that I'm talking about here. So if we all agree that change is already happening at scale, I repeat that, uh, and that multiple solutions are required from an investor perspective, where should we invest? Uh, Vaclav Smil reminds us that basically, after we increased our energy and power density needs dramatically, we want now to find solutions to re totally reverse those past trends. I think uh, a simple way for those of us who, tho those of us in this room who are not energy geeks like us, a simple way to say this is 
uh, basically to address the emissions in different utilizations, different technologies will be required. You will need solar PV, but you also need CSP. You will need solar PV, but you need some storage with it. Uh, you will need massive energy efficiency programs and heat recovery in the industrial sector. And you need, obviously, nuclear. And why I'm pointing at nuclear? Because uh, you have uh, the, the, the wider electrification that we want in, in, in the economy, uh, and that's beyond EVs. I mean, I'm talking about ed edge computing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, smart homes, etc. That, at the end of the day, puts additional pressure on the utilities to decarbonize uh, first and to decarbonize faster. So uh, nuclear energy provided 4% of global energy in 2018. That's 2,700 terawatt hours. It hasn't grown sin since 2002. Uh, Kasmin, I'm, I would be more interested to hear your thoughts about where we stand on research and fusion efficient. I mean, is, is it going to really solve our problem from on the utilities side? But in terms of technologies, I... Um, there are a few counterintuitive trends that I want to highlight here, that which, has been, which have been really driving investments for more than a decade now. And, and when I say counterintuitive, it's really for anyone who believes today that investors are, all of them, are deserting for fossil fuels altogether. So the first, here again, counterintuitive trend is that we still have massive efforts and massive investments to recover more hydrocarbons in terms of production. We are trying as much as possible to optimize the efficient use of hydrocarbons produced, and a lot of money is going into that. A lot of money is going, especially in the, when we try to increase the focus on low-cost low fuels, but also low-carbon fuels. And the reason for that is very simple. Today, you have less than 20% of hydrocarbon molecules extracted from the Earth. That's oil, gas, and coal, of course, but less than 20% of that actually turns into useful end use. Energy, plastics, etc. Only 20%. The rest is was wasted. So today, the industry has realized that, and there are tremendous efforts happen happening to restructure the business models and reward the optimizing an efficient few use of, uh, of, of fuels instead of rewarding uh, the volumes of hydrocarbon produced. So there are efforts, as you can see, of vertical integration at scale into refining, into petrochemicals by several large players. That's an, one example of these efforts. And uh, uh, I'll cite one last extreme example of the crude chemical scheme that uh, is uh, being looked at in Saudi Arabia. That, that the aim is really to reach 70% conversion rate from crude to plastics. Um, Second interesting dynamic is happening in mobility. And here uh, uh, I'll get into uh, uh, the internal combustion engine. So there are, again, massive R&D efforts and investments happening in the area of ultra-low emission fuels and, and engine technologies. So with that, you can assume that the internal com combustion engine can still enjoy a few years of monopoly in the transportation sector. But in parallel, there is a drive among uh, cities, among politicians, to ensure that transport prices are actually better reflecting externalities, internal costs, and other things. So to really have a view on the real cost of transportation, the real cost of urban and road transportation. So with the development of all those technology solutions that we see in, in Europe and, and US, etc., smart charging schemes, ride hailing, bike sharing, there are increasing calls, uh, especially among cities, for uh, the right pricing framework, a fair pricing framework for the use of public space by these charging stations, for the use of, for the utilization of commodities and the scarcity of resources that, are, that go into this, those technologies. And when you run the numbers, at the end of the day, you, you find that liquid fuels are, might be actually the winners from these all, let's all cost in everything approaches. And uh, I'm just saying. Uh, third point, uh, in addition to solar and wind and, and storage in its different forms, and I think we discussed it extensively last year, but here again, I want to highlight in a context of continuously this decreasing costs in storage as well, uh, the uncertainties about which technology will win, will win. I mean, uh, beyond lithium ion and uh, redox flow batteries, Concerns about the commodities 
uh, that are being mined in, in, in tricky places in Africa needed for specific storage technologies. And even when regulators show enough, I would say, creativity to reward flexibility, uh, investors remain concerned. They remain very concerned and wary, again, of, of regret costs in those technologies. So a couple of points to conclude. What is left for governments to do? I think, uh, and that, comes, that came today in the discussion between uh, Patrick Poyanné and Laurent Fabius, May, uh, but uh, we organized at Apicorp uh, a recent strategic industry roundtable where we brought people from the energy sector and the financing uh, community together in a single room under Shatam House rule to uh, address the question of um, what are the instruments that are needed to accelerate the energy transition. And, um, and, and yeah, these two communities don't really talk to each other most of the time, so that's why we thought it would be interesting to bring them together. Uh, and the, the very first recommendation that came up was uh, the need to formalize a price on carbon, any price, but just formalize a price on carbon. That's, that was considered as the single most effective mechanism to really enable a level playing fields between the different technologies and the consumer's choices. But the problem is, in the absence of carbon trading mechanisms, and I'm here thinking outside of Europe and, and some other places, um, what is being proposed, for example, in the American Green New Deal, when we start estimating the social cost of carbons, it's ended up producing ridicul ridiculously wide ranges. So when we leave it to the economists, uh, we ended up having very complex calculations when it comes to carbon prices. So and even if carbon taxes should, be in, in theory, be an easy form of, of, of carbon pricing. So the cal I agree, the calculation is complex. I agree, uh, non-marginal changes related to climate change have to be factored in. I agree the tax has to be revenue neutral, but the first steps are required, and you hear that from both communities alike, and from the governments as well. What is left for companies to do, and I'll finish with that, um, these two graphics that I'm showing on my slide really summarize, I think, the dilemma facing the energy sector. On, on I think, the left-hand side, uh, uh, you can see it's, the energy sector is one of the sectors that provided the lowest returns to shareholders during the last decade just among the S&P 500. It's a fraction of what IT or real estate have provided. The energy sector is really today competing with other sectors that are deemed much more attractive for, for, for investors in terms of returns. And, and, th and the problem is that the gap is really wide, as you can see. Uh, energy provides less than 10% of return, while IT or consumers have provided more than 300% over a decade. And the other problem is that in terms of valuation, some parts of, of, of the energy sector seem undervalued. I'm mainly talking about the upstream side of it, but there's always that persistent fear of stranded assets uh, because we don't have the clarity over, over, over the climate change trajectory. And on the other side, in the right-hand side, you can see that in parallel, returns are also being squeezed in the different parts of the value chain. I took here the example of the gas sector, uh, but the same is true across the board. So if, if, if they really want to survive through the energy transitions and continue to provide an, active, uh, an attractive value propositions for the investors, energy companies have no other choice than to embark on vertical integration at scale, and that's not, only, that's not only vertical integration as in the past to stabilize the earning by, uh, by benefiting from the country cyclical uh, uh, profits in upstream and downstream, that's really also to maximize the margins across the value chain. And on top of that, in the national oil companies particularly, the 80% the production that uh, Patrick Poyenne was referring to earlier today, they are directed, they are instructed to extract additional value from the sovereign uh, and finite oil and gas resources. Um, so for corporate strategies, I would say that a low carbon world is retranslating really into more integration, more scale, more optimization. And uh, then I would just like to remind everyone that the journey of integration is really a marriage between two different business models, two different operating cultures, returns, expectations, and time horizon. And so why I'm saying that is that after the integrated management of, of this different segment of the value chain, the next step might be to seek, it is actually to seek growth by optimizing the balance sheet even further. And that's the pressure that we are having also 
in, in, in terms of financing the energy sector. So in, in some areas, I mean, US Shell benefited, as you all know, partly from, from long-term commitments from private equities. Uh, if you start considering oil and gas resources as just any other investment asset class, the same could happen at a larger scale between large and oil energy companies and investment funds. Um, so what type of industry structure will we get in that drive for, for low carbon world? But I would like to finish on a, oh, I didn't have it here, but I had a, I had a nice slide showing that after all, within the infrastructure sector, uh, the energy sector remains the preferred industry for institutional investors. And I'll finish with that. Okay, thank you very much, Leila. Um, yeah, I cannot agree more that government should do the carbon price or carbon tax to, to give the clear message to the business sector. Unfortunately, the discussion more than decades didn't lead us to the, any official carbon price or carbon tax. That, that's a problem. It's, it's definitely the best way to reduce carbon, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So in a way, for the green financing, as you say, one of the criteria for the investors is does corporation have the internal carbon pricing for the decision of the investment? And that is happening. I mean, TCFD, uh, Task Force for Climate, I mean, D Financial Risk Disclosure, certainly internal carbon pricing is one of the things they request. And many major oil company like uh, Total, BP, Shell, they are the member signatory to the TCFD and doing even uh, of course, are they, these, these internal carbon pricing is uh, really uh, ambitious enough? That's a question. But uh, 40, 50, 60 dollars are set. And uh, in, uh, in, the, in the interesting discussion in ISEF in, in Japan was that uh, last year, exactly the same time, uh, the ISF meeting, I talk, uh, I raise the issue of internal carbon pricing by saying there is only one or two Japanese companies who had the internal carbon price at that time. Now, uh, the CDP representative told me in, in the public discussion that there are 70, 70 companies in Japan has now the internal carbon price. So this is a huge difference because, uh, as I said, 200 Japanese corporations are now signatory to TCFD. So TCFD means they should have a kind of energy scenario for the future. Otherwise, they can, uh, well, sustainability scenario definitely contain, uh, include the carbon pricing. So eventually, this kind of pressure from the financial sector for requesting disclosure will lead the corporations to what uh, is desirable in terms of the carbon pricing. That is my observation. Yeah. Do you think so? Or, or, uh? Yeah, I fully agree. And in all the models that I've seen uh, in, in various, uh, I would say, energy companies, international and national, uh, you basically have three main frames. You always have a cell with carbon pricing on it. Whether you, you, you fill it or not, that's another question. But conceptually, you have usually two main methodologies. You, I mean, you either just follow blindly what you have in the ETS, uh, and, and thanks to Europe, provided a, a sort of framework for, 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 a, for a carbon price. That can be used in other areas of the world, here again, conceptually. Or, as you, as you mentioned, you can just decide to have a flat what you think is an assumption for, for future pricing. And, that, and that's the reason why, at the end of the day, we end up uh, having that focus that I mentioned on not only low costs fuels and hydrocarbon, but also low, low carbon uh, crudes and hydrocarbon. So that's, uh, that's, not, that's, not an, that's not an idea that just came up yesterday. It's, it, I mean, I think the major oil and gas producers have been working on that for the last decade or so. But at the end of the day, I think people like to think of the a idea of carbon and uh, other fuels as a stock as well. So uh, you, that, that's a stock and you need to just put a price on it. And uh, when you decide to deplete that stock today or in 30 years time, uh, that's, 
that, that, that's an assumption that you have to make. But I, I totally agree that every, most energy companies today have carbon pricing assumption. Thank you very much, Leila. One additional question to you is that what do you think about this climate change and gender? Last year it was, what do you think about climate change in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> this year is what do you think about climate change and gender? Um, well, not, not much. I, I don't feel like an expert in the area, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I'll leave it to my male colleagues to comment on it. <laughs> okay, well, let's move to Richard Cooper. Richard, do you have some ideas about the no discussion? <coughs> But you have wisdom, I, we know, so please show your wisdom. On the uh, gender issue, I'll start out with that. I have uh, <clears throat> two teenagers. Uh, both are highly sensitive to the climate change issue, mm -hmm. and uh, the son no less than the daughter. <laughs> so at this generation, there's the generation a, 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 and a small, very small sample. <laughs> I don't notice any difference between the two. Uh, so, as an American uh, on the panel, I should say, uh, because uh, having sat through the plenaries yesterday and today, uh, uh, non-Americans should not confuse the U.S. government position under Mr. Trump with the American position. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand that people uh, implicitly, more than explicitly, assumed that uh, Trump leads the United States, and um, he does titularly, um, but he does not on attitudes toward many issues, and this is one of them. Um, it happens that uh, two weeks after Trump announced the U.S. potential future withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, the Conference of Mayors met, um, uh, representing 1,400 American cities, um, and they voted overwhelmingly to repudiate Trump on this particular issue, uh, uh, Republicans as well as Democrats across the country. Now, it has to be said at once that not all cities have climate change policies. Uh, the city that I come from does, but uh, not all cities do. Um, but, uh, uh, and the polls continue to show uh, climate change is uh, uh, not the most salient issue, but one of them uh, in the uh, attitudes of Americans. Um, the employer I work for, which is Harvard University, has a very aggressive green policy, they call it. Uh, I don't like that term, actually, but it has stuck. And, um, they're doing all kinds of things, including something that hasn't <coughs> been mentioned, uh, geothermal. We have a geothermal house. Uh, I have not uh, been given the uh, financial details on the building of the house, but they've drilled uh, way under earth and uh, uh, used the uh, stabilization of temperature in the earth, both for heating in the wintertime and cooling in the summertime. And uh, it's experimental and it's designed to show students what can be done. Um, uh, we'll see whether it works. Harvard has no lack of resources, so I'm not sure it would meet any investor standards uh, on that. So I'll, er, in my remarks, I will follow the uh, um, outline that uh, Fabius uh, uh, did this morning, uh, technology, finance, and policy. And um, the, on technology, what is amazing and would surprise anyone who has not looked at what's happened in the last 10 years, how uh, quickly the cost of solar, both versions, uh, uh, so solar photovoltaic and uh, concentrated solar, how quickly the cost has fallen compared with what it was a decade and certainly two decades ago, and how fast the uh, 
cost of uh, land-based wind has fallen. And uh, sea-based wind is falling, but it's still much above land-based wind. And um, the problem with solar and wind, of course, is storage. Uh, people talk about batteries. That's too narrow a way to think about it. There are many f forms of storage, mm -hmm. and batteries are only one of them. I know down the river at MIT, they're working hard on uh, batteries for uh, wind uh, uh, windmills, um, uh, which are not, they're, they're big uh, at the base of the uh, pylons. Uh, they're not for cars, uh, but they're alleged to be much more efficient than lead acid batteries and much less expensive than lithium batteries. Um, uh, but that's being worked on. But we should not forget uh, pumping of water yep. as a storage thing. That doesn't work very well if you live near the desert where there's a lot of sun and a lot of water, but in some parts of the world it works very well. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, heat storage, of course, uh, concentrated solar uh, uses heat storage, uh, metals which are heated up to uh, five uh, to 700 degrees centigrade, and that retains the heat through clouds and nighttime and so forth. Um, there is um, hydrogen, which you mentioned, which is a way to store, and uh, particularly we, if we're looking for motive fuels uh, and thinking ahead, uh, not to next year, but a decade or more, uh, this is a very good use of uh, uh, to store way to store um, uh, energy, and of course there are um, yeah, flywheels, uh, which again come up from time to time. Any physicist will remind you of them, but somehow they've dropped out of the picture in uh, storage. But one can imagine flywheels when we have very efficient flywheels these days. So um, we should not just talk about batteries when it comes to storage, but look at the whole, whole range of uh, potential storage uh, vessels or vehicles. Um, finance, um, and uh, various numbers have been floated about. I have not tested any of them, but uh, I find the numbers much too large, the ones that I see, uh, but that just may reflect my ignorance, but uh, this is a really, really good time to float securities. Interest rates in Europe are basically negative outside of Italy, and, uh, and uh, in Japan they're negative uh, uh, for governments, for uh, high quality uh, private or international securities they're positive, but very, very low. And we should uh, increase the capital of the international financial institutions, the World Bank, uh, ADB, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, and so forth, the EIB in, uh, in Europe, um, and have them, th 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 this is not a strain on budgets. Um, it does imply a guarantee, uh, but uh, this is a very good time to float a lot of uh, fixed interest securities. And uh, according to um, economic analysis, there's a heavy demand around the world for uh, high quality fixed interest securities, much of which goes into US treasuries, uh, but it could go into other uh, 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 vehicles as well. So it's a very good time and we should gin up the international financial institutions, I'm talking about the, not about the IMF, but, but about the, what we call banks, but they're not really banks, um, uh, to engage in this issue more than rhetorically. I know the World Bank has a big program in this uh, to study the issues and make recommendations. They do not do much lending uh, in it in this area as such. 
So that could, and several, you mentioned sovereign wealth funds, which is an, another source of funding. And they're looking around for good yields on uh, secure uh, securities. So I don't see at this um, moment in time a shortage of finance. It's a question of mobilizing the finance and providing to take care of some of the RIF government guarantees through uh, capital um, uh, promises of capital for these international institutions. Um, and uh, um, policy is the third category. And I was interested to mention, uh, to notice that Fabius mentioned carbon tax. I favored a carbon tax for 25 years. Uh, as this conference uh, illustrates, we, the world, have many objectives besides dealing with climate change. And one of them, in my view, is preserving the international trading system. I see a huge potential conflict between dealing with climate change on a national, or in the case of the EU uh, Union basis, and the trading system because the first thing that uh, firms, private firms and countries will want is protection uh, against competition from countries that do not have a comparable, whatever that means, um, climate change policy. And uh, once you can see those pressures in the United States, one can see them sometimes openly, much more covertly within Europe. Uh, it's not well noticed that when the uh, the ETS, the European Trading System, issued permits. They weigh, uh, well, they issued them to nations, and the nations, in turn, issued way over issued them to the steel industry in Italy, to the ceramics and glass industry, and so forth. These are indirect subsidi subsidies to these industries, and uh, the way to get around that is to have a internationally agreed carbon tax. Um, the number, actual number, would be a negotiated one. I would start out at $40 and test the waters uh, to see how it would be. And um, uh, with the proceeds of the tax to be held by each country levying the tax. So we don't get into the issue of international transfers, which raises a whole different ca can of worms and countries could do anything they want with the tax except undermine the purpose of it <laughs> through subsidies. And, um, and so, for example, it could be uh, neutral, revenue neutral. They could give it back to the public in various uh, ways. They could uh, redistribute it. They could hive off a certain portion for R&D on climate change. But that would be up to each country, actually, uh, what they did with the proceeds, in my view. My own view is that cap and trade, which is the favored um, device by environmentalists who sec accept the principle of uh, market in um, permits, um, cannot be made to work worldwide. Europe can make it work. The US, if we're, we're willing, could make it work. Uh, Canada can make it work, uh, but it cannot be made to work worldwide uh, for reasons we won't go into, but uh, it's an absolute invitation to corruption. Uh, you're handing out permits which have real monetary value. And that's a total invitation to corruption around the world. And uh, any US legislator who understood that uh, could not vote for it. Um, and. Uh, so I think, uh, and if you look at the models of uh, pricing of carbon through cap and trade, as in the ETS, uh, they all show that the big gains come from transfers between rich and poor countries, basically. Efficient countries, countries that use energy efficiently, and the, those that do not use it efficiently. And, um, so I uh, strongly favor, I, I'm interested that uh, Leila had mentioned them and uh, uh, this morning on the panel, they were mentioned. 
and cap and trade was not mentioned. I don't know whether that was inadvertent or whether I'm slowly, very slowly winning the argument. <laughs> uh, and, and the final thing I want to say as a matter of uh, agreed policy, whether it's universally agreed is less important, um, but we should be building no new coal-fired power plants anywhere in the world. Uh, we have them, we have a tremendous amount of inertia in the system. We will be using coal for decades uh, because as was pointed out today or earlier, uh, coal-fired power, <coughs> power plant, uh, 40 years was mentioned, but with some renovation, 50 years or 60 years they can last. And we have a lot of them around. Um, China <coughs> is backing out coal as rapidly as it can through many different channels, nuclear, LNG, solar, and so forth. <coughs> and, um, but because of air pollution and the harm to Chinese health, uh, they're building coal-fired power plants as part of BRI in other countries. That should be stopped. Um, and they should build, uh, I see, uh, in my own view, is that uh, in the end we'll do solar, basically. The end means out several decades, uh, and I see natural gas as being the bridging fuel to solar. And uh, in particular, natural gas is a great substitute for coal in uh, uh, generating electricity, as well as other uses, but uh, so I see Natural gas is the natural, or you can call it biogas, uh, any kind of methane, basically, <laughs> yeah, as a uh, natural bridging fuel uh, between where we are now and solar power, where we need to get to eventually supplemented by some other things. But, uh, but that's decades away. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, for this cap and trade thing is interesting point i i talked to some chinese people about that and china said i mean they are planning to have um, cap and trade in the six or seven provinces now they tried. The, but they, they now now they are moving out of it well be, be, yeah dropping it be, oh, I didn't know that. Be, dropping it because because yeah. solar is getting so cheap and cheaper than coal, so no need to make any kind of incentives in China. Well, I've, I've looked at the pilot projects. Uh, they were remarkably non-transparent. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to find out what actually went on in each of They started out with seven provinces, ended up with six, yes. and they declared it a success, but they did not, were not able to demonstrate to any outsider they were successful. And the uh, formulae for issuing the permits and so forth. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that they dropped it. Leila, do you have a comment on him about this tax or carbon price? No, I think we, are, we agree, right? I mean, I think we were agreeing all the way through. So uh, here again, I mean, uh, let's not make it complex and let's uh, agree on on, 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 uh, on, on, on the now, I mean, agree on a price is probably a big word, but at least have have some indications and uh, take the first steps here again to get back to the level playing fields between the different technologies. And uh, as I mentioned, I mean, in 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 mobility, the 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 the, the, the efforts to have all costing approaches are creating perverse effects, where uh, you actually favor the existing. Uh, technologies and systems. So at the end of the day, if we want to cost uh, carbon in such a way, let, let's do it in an integrated way. And, uh, and I think, but let's, let's keep the scheme as, as simple as possible. Yeah. Okay, let's move to Cosmin. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, uh, for this opportunity uh, to be part of this panel. And um, my my presentation, basically, I don't have any slides, but my presentation will be a shameless um, advocacy for nuclear energy. Why, why, why it's shameless? Zero oh, no, no, no. <laughs> zero, zero carbon. Zero carbon. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I, that's why I'm very proud. <laughs> so, um, 
I'll start with um, I'll I'll start with some figures. And basically, today today's realities, I think, they call for immediate action. And based on IEA data that was vehiculated here, energy consumption worldwide grew by 2.3% in 2018 alone. Uh, nearly twice the average rate of growth since 2010. So we've seen we're seeing an increasing um, um, demand uh, for for energy. Um, as a consequence of higher energy consumption, uh, energy-related CO2 emissions also increased by 1.7 percent at 33.1 uh, gigatons of uh, CO2. Therefore, we are now we are nowhere near the Paris Agreement, and. Um, to be honest with you, um, we will be very far away from it for a long period of time. As an important percentage of CO2 emissions are energy related, uh, the pace of transitioning then becomes even more difficult. And from my experience in the nuclear industry, two major variables need very fast addressing. Investments in clean energy sources and related financial campaigning be it campaigning as a PR uh, initiative supported by the governments to bolster in investor confidence in, 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 in uh, these investments, or as Leila very well indicated earlier, uh, coming up with uh, risk hedging um, mechanisms to make the opportunities attractive enough in, in today's uh, um, capital competition. Um, the World Energy Outlook um, estimates around $1.1 trillion to be invested in nuclear power by 2040, which means approximately 46% in nuclear power output. Even though the WEO estimates an increase in nuclear power investments, globally, nuclear generation will go below 10%, and far less than the required output of nuclear production as per the sustainable development uh, scenario that was uh, that was uh, shown previously by uh, Monsieur Affaire. So, and I'll take a little bit of, of a look at Europe. Um, based on the EU directions of the 2030 framework for energy climate policy, there is a need, a need at least at the European level to reach the targets of decarbonization through means of technology neutrality and common efforts for the application of um, efficient support mechanisms in areas where market challenges hamper major investment projects as a sustainable transition to clean energy. So this is where I am. I'm a strong uh, advocate for the development of nuclear energy as an important contributor to a stable clean energy mix and as a solution for the baseload of a clean energy mix. Um, and obviously this is, cannot not only be achieved by new build and long-term uh, long operations of nuclear power plants refurbishments, but more so by extending innovation into re research for generation four projects, the new type of uh, nuclear reactors that also allow for flexibility and allow for p possible hybrid nuclear renewable systems that where you can have a small modular reactor coupled with uh, a, a, a solar panel and two windmills, and they can balance each other out um, very, very nicely. Um, and Romania, I can tell you very much, endorses this approach. That is why they're supporting the R&D project for a new uh, lead-cooled based uh, reactor, generation four reactor. That's why we're looking at new other new technologies, such as the molten salt reactors in, in France or new scale. In, uh, in the US. Um, and that is why we're part of the clean energy, uh, clean energy ministerial approach, uh, the Nice Future Initiative, uh, that promotes the benefits of nuclear. And uh, the, the, it's a branding, an international branding exercise to brand nuclear as green energy. And I think that's part of the reality that we need to, that we need to face. Um, and to endorse that, I'll make a quick uh, allusion to an MIT study that was uh, uh, to decarbonization that was launched in 2018, I believe already, uh, which adds um, 
Nuclear energy is a firm source essential to achieving a deeply decarbonized electricity sector. For most regions, EU included, meeting the 2050 targets requires a mix of resources, mainly firm resources, fact which should be fully accounted for in decarbonization policies and meeting targets. Policies that foreclose a role for nuclear energy directly impact investments in nuclear energy and directly increase the cost of decarbonization. Policies that support decarbonization via a single source directly impact not only the cost and pace of decarbonization, but wholesale markets, generators, energy systems, and end consumers. And I'll invite you to, to, to look into the study because they do a very, very good um, demonstration of, of, of this uh, thesis. And out of that, I've extracted uh, from the World Nuclear Association um, the world's, um, how the world would look like in terms of emissions without nuclear. And in 2018, uh, the world was supplied 2,563 terawatt hours of electricity from nuclear sources. If we didn't have nuclear power and say we s we've um, um, replaced it with coal, <laughs> I didn't say lignite, I said coal. Um, we'd have an additional emission of um, 2,276 million tons of CO2. If we were to go to natural gas, we'd be looking at 1,278 1, uh, extra million tons of CO2 per year emitted. So I think that that says a lot. Um, and if a few years ago financing was the last thing to consider, I think now it's actually the first. Because a few years ago we were thinking about depolitization, how if we shut down, we don't shut down, security. I think we've, we've proved that nuclear safety and nuclear security is, is evolving very much and with the new technologies we're, we're, we're right there. Um, and with this realization under COP24 and a lot of the governments looking, turning back and reconsidering nuclear um, as a green source of energy and branding it as such, or taking policies not for green source but low carbon energy, which is probably the more scientific way to, put, uh, to frame a policy, um, then it's up to us companies to get to do our job. And unfortunately, we cannot really raise a lot of money for nuclear if we don't have state, if we don't have state support. Um, because de-risking nuclear is paramount. And that is from the initial stages of a project. Um, and it has two, two, two potential risks that need to, a, a nuclear project has three risks that need to be looked at. The first one is construction risk which we've seen recently that a lot of projects have become over, um, have become over budget and not necessarily in time. Um, a lot of the large companies, uh, service suppliers such as Westinghouse or SNC-Lavalin can do, um, even, um, even on a number of the uh, South Korean, uh, Chinese uh, nuclear companies, are pulling out of the lump sum turnkey EPC model. Um, we know that a lump sum turnkey EPC contract even led to the reorganization of Arriva, which says a lot about where we are in terms of construction. Um, and that, that it has more to do with the way in which we, we, we manage costs, in which the services have become more efficient, and governments need to be uh, part of the solution or financial institutions need to be part of the solution to come out with surety bonds or, or ways to, um, to finance also, also through consumer um, um, driven needs this type of new, uh, the, uh, new builds. And here, for example, I'd like to put in, in light the, regula the regulated asset-based model and the contract for difference model that's being used by Hinkley Point um, in, uh, in, in the UK. The second part 
which becomes more interesting here, is uh, regulation. Regulation and political risk. I think this is probably the number one, uh, the number one risk that investors, that is pushing investors away from, uh, from, from nuclear projects, outside of the construction risks, and from taking equity as, uh, in, into nuclear utilities. And this is mainly due to the fact that um, nuclear is highly regulated. Uh, it has become also overregulated, if I were if I were to say so. You need about um, you need about uh, a pieces a, a nuclear spare parts weight in paper to move it from one point to another. So I think that we've 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 exaggerated a little bit on on the nuclear safety side. We're we're not saying that the processes are are bad, but the the bureaucracy around it have made it uh, a little bit unpractical. And with each bureaucracy that's being layered up, you hire more people and you you know print more uh, more paper. And I've actually that drives opex even higher. So obviously that needs to be, and it has a financial impact on the project. So here is more of um, a government's approach to how, how, they, how they manage bureaucracy. But it's also depoliticizing because say you've invested in nuclear, you had, you had an equity stake in a nuclear power plant that was put into function in 2008 in Germany. In 2010, you have just finished your construction. You, as a fund manager, you're looking to get a 20-year return on it. And 2010, boom, second year of operation, your plant is shut down because of a, of a, of a natural uh, uh, disaster that had unintended uh, consequences and didn't necessarily realify a problem with the nuclear industry, was spun off in a, in a political campaign, and and, and then created a, a shutdown for nuclear, not only in Germany, but mostly in Europe, because we have to, we have to be pragmatic about it. I think that up until two years ago, um, the European Commission was afraid to say uh, the N-word, and here we're talking about nuclear. And secondly, uh, we were also had a very difficult time. Um, you know, we, we've had a full industry shutdown. So the new focus should stem from aligning economic welfare with long-term interests of the society because we're talking about decarbonization, we're talking about security of supply and maintaining our lifestyle. We still want to be, have zero emissions, but as you know, uh, Professor Masuda said earlier, we still like it to be cool in this room. And I think that's, that's, that's uh, very important. And yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lots of uphill battle for the nuclear. I, I cannot agree more. It's a it, it's a tough after Fukushima accident. Uh, yeah, it is really challenging. Let's move to Masuda-san. We have 20 minutes to go, so keep it in less than 10 minutes. I'm sorry. Very well. Thank you very much, Tanaka-san, and thank you for coming all. I'll be talking about some issue of generational divide on the climate agenda. Climate change is uh, the result of the accumulation of CO2 emissions or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere well over the last two, 200 years. Assess assessment report five of 2014, they cover about long range from 1970, 50 to 2011. This is the magnitude of period we have to cover, and uh, that is, means that what we do today with all these efforts do not necessarily benefit the generation, mature generation here, except the younger ones. That means why we like work like a hell if we cannot get the benefit of deleting climate risks. That is a big issue. Already, climate change is eating into the heart of the system. Today and yesterday, there is an enormous typhoon hitting heart of Japan. That is, it's a, we call it Super Typhoon 
Hagibis. Seven million people evacuated for precautionary measures centering Tokyo area. Can you imagine seven million people evacuated? And already several people have died. And it is the largest ever hitting Japan over the last 60 years. And this could be the norm in coming years or so. Climate actions, mitigation in particular, are of very long-term nature because of 200 years scale could be shifted to another 100 years or so. And it's not, unfortunately, it's not appealing to politicians. Politicians, I sympathize with politicians because they face with so many agenda, employment, pension, education, healthcare, building infrastructure, all these agenda. And if, because they are pressed with the pressure of re-election and election, they like to shift their attention to rather short-term issues which they can sell to the voters. And quite often, the long-term issues could be set aside or left behind unless there is many room to accommodate all these demand. However, however painful, we have to deal with climate issues, not setting aside. And we have to overcome the generational divide. And that kind of issue, I know there's a lot of criticism to what Greta Thunberg said, UN, and there's a, I saw many articles and videos in YouTube and elsewhere telling her what you uh, have said is brainwashed or exaggerating the risks. But it's, it's not the way to persuade younger generations. I saw many big speeches in the UN Climate Summit. Big speeches, 100 times, gathering seven, several hundred people, several thousand people, but speeches don't mean anything unless underpinned by concrete actions. And a history shows very sad record. For example, if you remember, there was a famous Rio summit in 1990. Many head of states came in Rio and wrote a wonderful declaration of action-oriented one. They committed they will decrease CO2 emissions to 1990 level by the end of the 20th century. In a matter of 10 years, they, they promised, they signed. Was it followed by actions? No, nothing happened. Rather, more CO2 emissions accelerated because of economic growth everywhere. And real action was taken in 1997 at COP7 of Kyoto Protocol. But Kyoto Protocol took eight years to be effectuated because of signatory, they need ratification by many countries. So already 15 years has passed with no actions after Rio summit in 1990. And we should not repeat all these mistakes made. What Greta said at the UN Nations shocked me because I was part of energy policy making together with Tanaka and others, and I am partly responsible for that. And uh, I think we have to do something, and we cannot leave all these younger generations left, left behind or keep the generation gap un, un, uh, narrowed because we are responsible for the next generation and future generations. I am suggesting something very wild. Yes, our generation was challenged by this young little girl from Sweden on 
23rd September at the United Nations. That challenge should be responded with sincerity and with concrete steps on top of what we have agreed upon in Paris in 2015. How Japanese government can respond to her accusation? Yes, Richard Cooper said, no coal fire plants, but my mother country is now constructing or planning 44 coal fired power plants because of cost issues, because of economic growth first. It's natural for the government and industry desire for that option, but this is not the answer for the future generation. There should be a coordinated response, not regretting in the past, but coordinated response to this young little girl representing future generation next year at the UN Climate Summit. And that should be widely shared by the entire population of the planet. Then that will be the first step to narrow the gap between us and the forthcoming generation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Masuda-san, for kind of confessing our sin. But um, let's move to... Uh, Thank you, Ali-san, for waiting f so long. But uh, we, uh, you will share with us about the great success story in Morocco about renewable energy, I guess. Thank you. Alors, pour ma part, je vais saisir cette opportunité, ce luxe, qui est de s'exprimer en français dans une conférence internationale. Donc, je ne vais pas laisser passer cette euh, possibilité. Euh, J'aimerais aborder en fait le sujet des défis auxquels peuvent faire face les pays en voie de développement globalement pour l'accès à l'énergie et donc pour l'accélération du développement des énergies renouvelables. Et pour ce faire, vous me permettrez de faire ce qu'on appelle dans le cinéma un petit retour en arrière et revenir dans les années 2000 qui ont connu un rythme de croissance très soutenu de par le monde en même temps qu'une prise de conscience et un renforcement de cette prise de conscience qu'il fallait s'inscrire dans le, un développement économique durable tout en euh, étant soucieux euh, de la préservation de notre environnement. Donc cette forte croissance économique a engendré également à son tour une forte demande en termes d'énergie qui a exercé une pression importante sur les ressources fossiles existantes. Et je me rappelle encore qu'en 2008 et en juillet 2008, plus exactement, le prix du baril du pétrole avait culminé à 147 de dollars le, le baril. Donc cette situation à cette époque avait créé une véritable pression, comme je le, le disais, sur l'économie des, des économies des pays. Euh, et sur la communauté internationale et plus particulièrement sur les pays en voie de développement et ceux les plus vulnérables comme les états insulaires ou les pays les moins avancés et quand j'entends les plus vulnérables ce sont les pays qui n'ont pas de ressources fossiles et qui se devaient de trouver une alternative aux, à ces énergies euh, fossiles à l'instar du Maroc la plupart de ces pays ne voulaient pas hypothéquer hein, leur euh, ambition et leur volonté de développement socio social et économique et surtout ils devaient répondre de manière positif aux aspirations de leur population quant à l'éradication de la pauvreté et donc euh, euh, le développement économique euh, et le développement de leur ni niveau de vie. Euh, le Maroc avait à l'époque euh, commencé à analyser, à décrypter les différentes tendances et euh, surtout les tendances autour des métiers des énergies renouvelables et des technologies des énergies renouvelables. Et on avait compris à cette époque-là que vu les énormes investissements à venir en R&D, surtout côté européen, mais également en Chine et, en, et aux États-Unis, qu'il y avait une tendance positive sur le développement des énergies renouvelables et surtout sur la réduction de prix autour de ces technologies. Et donc, grâce à la vision de Sa Majesté le Roi Mohamed VI, le Maroc a fait preuve de courage et d'audace à cette époque en s'engageant sur cette voie qui aujourd'hui, a posteriori, s'est avérée concluante, euh, judicieuse et pertinente à tout point de vue, mais qu'à l'époque, rappelons-nous-le, ce n'était pas totalement évident. 
Je ne vais pas trop m'étendre sur les réalisations du Maroc, puisqu'on les connaît tous, et je pense que l'année dernière, ça avait été euh, abordé. Donc, euh, cette voie nous, avait, nous a permis euh, d'entrevoir un dépassement de l'objectif de 42% à l'horizon 2020 et 52% à l'horizon 2030. Mais je vais beaucoup plus développer sur la situation actuelle et le formidable euh, potentiel que re peuvent représenter les énergies renouvelables pour la coopération et l'intégration régionale. Ce sera là le point sur lequel je vais vraiment me concentrer et je vais essayer d'être rapide. Euh, je veux dire qu'aujourd'hui, le, le paradigme a complètement changé, c'est complètement métamorphosé, puisqu'il y a dix ans encore, on était face à un choix manichéen entre énergie fossile et énergie renouvelable. Les énergies fossiles euh, pêchées par le manque d'intérêt euh, autour des questions envi environnementales, mais euh, présentaient un avantage comparatif économique qui était certains par rapport aux énergies renouvelables qui, elles, pêchaient par ce manque de compétitivité économique. Et on voit qu'à l'époque, tout le monde s'orientait vers les énergies fossiles et les gens ne parlaient pas trop des énergies renouvelables. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut imaginer un instant de revenir aux énergies fossiles Parce que qu'est-ce qui se passerait Il y aurait une pression telle sur le prix que ça euh, hypothéquerait également la croissance, déjà qu'elle est actuellement à tonnes, mais ça... Euh, ça aurait un impact négatif sur, sur la croissance actuelle. Donc, euh, la pression évitée par l'investissement massif dans les énergies re renouvelables, puisque je le rappelle, les énergies renouvelables, que ce soit le, le vent, quand il vente, ben, il vente pour tout le monde. Quand le soleil brille, il brille pour tout le monde. S'il est exploité, c'est pour le bien de ceux qui le transforment et des populations qui en bénéficient. Quand il n'est pas exploité, il est perdu pour tout le monde. Donc, les énergies renouvelables se démarque des énergies fossiles dans la mesure où il n'y a pas de compétition entre les pays autour des énergies renouvelables. Et donc cette amélioration de la péréquation économique autour du renouvelable, découlant de la multiplication des investissements et donc des économies d'échelle qui sont engendrées, ce qui veut dire que plus les investissements sont nombreux, plus euh, les prix baisseront sans compétition, je le répète, entre les différents euh, pays. C'est donc un véritable vecteur de coopération entre les pays. Euh, et je vais vous donner quelques exemples concrets de coopération qui ont été initiés par le, par le Maroc et qui ont permis en fait de lancer une certaine dynamique. Alors, on se rappelle que la COP21 a suscité une forte adhésion une forte mobilisation autour d'une ambition pour limiter les gaz à effet de, de serre. Et ici, à Marrakech, la COP22 se voulait être la COP de l'action. Donc, les pays participants et les pays membres devaient faire preuve d'ingéniosité, d'imagination, afin de concevoir des actions concrètes et sortir des grands mots, des actions concrètes qui vont avoir un impact réel sur le développement des énergies re renouvelables et euh, directement... Euh, diminuer les gaz à effet de serre. Cinq pays se sont associés lors de la COP22 à Mar Marrakech pour augmenter la part des énergies renouvelables dans leur mix énergétique en intégrant les marchés des énergies renouvelables entre eux. Ces cinq pays sont la France, l'Allemagne, le Portugal, l'Espagne et le Maroc qui ont initié ce qu'on appelle la SET Roadmap, Sustainable Electricity Trade Roadmap, entre ces cinq pays. S'en est suivi une série d'études de coûts-bénéfices qui ont donné le confort politique nécessaire à ces différents pays, puisque ces différentes études, avec le soutien de la Banque mondiale, de la Commission européenne et de l'UPM, ont permis de démontrer que chacun des pays, à des niveaux différents, pouvait engendrer des dizaines de milliards de bénéfices en intégrant les marchés des énergies renouvelables. Et ceci a abouti à la signature d'une nouvelle déclaration à la Commission européenne en décembre dernier. Et puis, je viens de revenir de Madrid la semaine dernière, où les discussions finales autour d'un binding MOU entre ces cinq pays sont presque finalisées et qui donneraient lieu à la signature avant la fin d'année d'un MOU engageant entre ces cinq pays pour intégrer la première partie qui est le, le euh, Cross-Border Green Corporate PPA entre ces cinq pays. Donc c'est une nouvelle très importante qui pourra permettre un développement massif des énergies renouvelables puisque plus on élargit le réseau, plus on peut élargir la part des énergies renouvelables. Pour, pour finir, une dernière action est également très importante 
Et euh, j'abonde dans le sens de M. Massouda, puisqu'il fallait également sortir des grands discours non productifs. Et lors de la journée d'action climat, à la, euh, le 23 septembre dernier, mon président, M. Mustafa Bakouri, aux côtés du président du Bhoutan, du président du Malawi, de la présidente de l'Éthiopie, du président de la BAD, a lancé une nouvelle initiative au bénéfice des pays les moins avancés et des, états et des petits États insulaires qui vise à accélérer l'accès durable à l'énergie dans ces différents pays. Avec deux annonces majeures, c'est que dès le début de l'année prochaine, un moment fort sera organisé pour la naissance réelle de cette initiative qui, je le rappelle, a été sélectionné parmi plus de 150 propositions qui ont été faites au secrétariat général pour être présentées le jour du 23 septembre et bénéficient d'ores et déjà du soutien de plus de 80 pays et institutions. Donc les désannonces majeures sont euh, l'accompagnement d'une première liste d'une dizaine de pays pour le développement de capacités ENR principalement en Afrique. Et la deuxième, c'est le développement d'un centre de compétences pour le partage d'expertise et le renforcement des capacités. J'en terminerai là peut-être en disant une dernière chose. C'est que nous avons une conviction plus, euh, au plus profond de nous-mêmes que les énergies renouvelables sont un véritable facteur de coopération politique et économique. Combien de guerres on est à cause de la rareté des ressources et à cause de la course des pays et de la compétition entre les pays pour aller chercher ces ressources. La coopération politique autour des énergies renouvelables vient du fait qu'aucun pays ne peut bénéficier des ressources d'un autre pays. Quand le soleil brille dans un pays, il brille dans ce pays. Et donc, le manque de compétition autour des énergies renouvelables donne tout le sens à, à, à la coopération politique. La coopération économique, parce que peut-être pour la première fois, les pays les moins avancés ont une chance. La chance, c'est que quand le vent souffle, ou quand la chance, c'est que de sortir de, des défauts qu'ils ont connus euh, au regard des énergies fossiles. Combien de pays exportaient son fuel, son pétrole brut, et réimportent du pétrole ou du fuel raffiné Aujourd'hui, grâce aux énergies renouvelables, il est impossible de le faire. La transformation et la valeur ajoutée industrielle liée à cette transformation est, doit être localisée et ne peut être localisée ailleurs que dans ce pays. C'est pour ça que nous parlons de coopération économique. Et grâce à l'impulsion qu'a donnée Sa Majesté, principalement en Afrique, le sens de l'adage africain qui dit que « if you want to walk fast, walk alone, and if you want to walk far, Walk with the others, prend tout son sens dans aujourd'hui la politique globale qui initie le Maroc à travers Mazen euh, pour le développement de la coopération politique et économique autour des énergies renouvelables. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, yeah, I think uh, the renewable energy in Morocco is a really Uh, great, uh, let's say, uh, transformation of the energy system in this area, and especially the uh, kind of inter uh, regional integration of the grid line is a very interesting example and probably a model for the uh, Northeast Asia. That is my argument. Japan, Korea, China, we are, I mean, especially between China and Japan, we have serious problem. Political uh, dispute is getting to the very critical level even. So, but uh, if we have a po power line grid connection with uh, Korea, China, Russia, I mean, economic uh, cooperation and collaboration may lead us eventually toward peaceful, uh, well, Europe is not as peaceful as before, but uh, we may move into the kind of integration in the future. So I really wish you a great success. By the way, we have now two minutes left. If there is any question, urgent question, I will give you the floor. Thank you. I just want to add one thing. We, we talked about big power, but we should talk also about decentralized power today. It's amazing what's going on. We have this project on wind and solar, but also we are helping farmers to switch from diesel pump to solar pumps. We're talking about 300 megawatts today installed just for solar pumping. 
we are talking about helping people to reduce their energy consumption. Energy efficiency is a key also at the same time as renewable energy. We need to have this approach with energy efficiency. Another point, one you mentioned, and uh, uh, Mr. Upper talked about biomethane. Here in this city, in Marrakech, you can visit the station de transfer, the, the treatment des eaux usées. We are using biomass, biogas coming from those treatment st water treatment station. And that's why we are looking for all technologies, as Mrs. Benali talked about. Many solutions are here. But we have centralized ones with a very low price. We're talking about three cents per kilowatt hour for the wind, four cents per kilowatt hour for PV. It's amazing what's going on, the price. And Mr. Cooper mentioned that it's very important how the impact for power is one thing, but power for, pop for the population directly. Many solar roofs in the industry are under development today in Morocco. We're talking about thousands of megawatts that can be installed in the future, just decentralized in the decentralized way. And it's very as important as the other part. Thank you. Thank you very much for very good input to our discussion. Just as uh, Masuda-san said, uh, we need action. So maybe next year, I mean, not only discussing the things like this, can we visit the plant, biogas plant in Marrakesh as a group? That is much more interesting than discussing the issues for yes. in an endless manner. Please. If you allow me, uh, yes. Chairman, very rapidly. Uh, I think uh, 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 biomethane methane production is on the verge of rapid development. The reason is I'm involved in an enterprise in Montreal that, uh, that does um, uh, urban waste management, all kinds of urban waste. And uh, we started five years ago to produce uh, biomethane. And uh, uh, we do produce it, we do collect it, we do clean it bring it to pipeline quality, and then we re-inject in the pipeline and we, through swaps, we sell methane through North America. It has become, on our P&L, the first line for revenue and contribution to the EBITDA. So it's a real success. So, and and the, the, uh, in South America nowadays, it's, they're going through a privatization of this industry, and uh, we are attracted, of course, by that, and uh, so are the, uh, the funds, the large funds, because they see in urban waste uh, equipment uh, installations the same thing as they saw when I was in the electricity sector as a, a huge potential for them to invest uh, and uh, we've done that in uh, Chile and Peru and uh, Colombia, all over uh, South America. Secondly, it's another the very different uh, 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 remark. I do agree fully with you, Chairman, that uh, it's a very good idea to interconnect Siberia with North Korea and South Korea, because in Siberia there's a huge hydro uh, potential. And, uh, and that would, uh, I think, uh, uh, support peace efforts between the North and the South, uh, and South Korea. That were my two remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, the time is up, but uh, I, I think uh, we had another interesting discussion, starting with bio uh, and uh, uh, congratulations, Olivia. That was a very interesting input, and we have certain uh, you know, discussion about uh, this issue. Um, uh, well, uh, please uh, join me thanking the uh, six panelists for the interesting discussion t tonight. And Chairman's role, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're most welcome. Let's see the biomethane plant next year. You can visit also some solar sure. farms. Fine. So, solar Maybe that is much more fun. <laughs> <laughs>